Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One-on-One. Singularity One-on-One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, my guest on the show is Michael Shermer. Mike, Dr. Michael Shermer is the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and an adjunct professor of Claremont Graduate University and Chapman University, as well as the author of The Believing Brain. So without further ado, hello, Michael, and welcome on Singularity One-on-One. Good, good morning. Good morning. For you, it's a very early morning, I know, <laughs> uh, yeah. in California. As an interesting side note, uh, one of the things that we have in common with uh, Dr. Sherman is that I uh, heard that he's also a cyclist. Yeah, I can see your bikes in the background there. What do you got hanging up there? I have a Cervelo R3. I'm very oh, nice. fortunate. Yeah. Very nice. Unfortunately, though, this morning I am in Canada, in Toronto. So uh, we, had, we have had unseasonably warm winters, plus six degrees Celsius. But this morning we woke up to a blizzard. So oh, I'm afraid my today. cycling is over for the next few months. <laughs> All right. Which makes me very jealous uh, with respect to you that you can enjoy a, a ride later on during this day. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me uh, jump uh, with the first question here, Michael. Can you please tell us a little more about yourself and your background? Uh, in terms of what? My science background? In terms of, uh, well, I'd like to... Uh, find out who my guests are not only as scientists because and of course their work and their books uh, are of primary importance here but I'd like to start a little bit more with further away with their personal background and how they got to be interested in science and uh, technology or skepticism in your case and so on. Right well I grew up in Southern California I went to Pepperdine University uh, which is a uh, evangelical conservative College and at the time that's what I was, <clears throat> and uh, but I was always interested in science. I I was a science fiction fan growing up, and you know a Star Trek fan. I was I'm of that generation <clears throat> when Star Trek was actually aired for the first time, and uh, and I didn't really want to know what I wanted to do in college other than astronomy seemed like the closest thing to science fiction. So I started there and. Uh, and then shifted to theology when I became really religious, and that's what I was going to major in at Pepperdine. But I was mostly interested in being a college professor and dealing with the the big questions in life, you know, about free will and determinism and is there a God and the nature of the universe, that sort of thing. And um, when I became, when I sort of lost my religion, uh, I shifted to experimental psychology, which is what I was doing. And um, I liked science more than theology because there was an actual way to get an answer to a question that was more than just argument and debate and disputation. It was, we can actually run an experiment, collect some data to see what is really going on. And so that appealed to me more than the religious worldview did. <clears throat> and so I've never really looked back. I, I've always been interested in the margins of science, the paranormal, pseudoscience, you know, all, all the revolutions and the cutting edges of science, some of which turns out to be true, most of which turns out not to be true. And so that's kind of how I gravitated toward being Mr. Skeptic was, uh, was, was carving out a niche on the margins of science and finding a, a little, um, I guess, a, a niche there of, of something that we could do at Skeptic that other people weren't doing. So, for example, my column in Scientific American called Skeptic, uh, I, I deal with subjects that they would not otherwise deal with in the magazine because they're busy doing more of the mainstream scientific controversy. So, and that's a, a, a little uh, example of what we do at Skeptic. In other words, we cover topics that most science magazines don't cover. And, uh, and so to that extent, I'm always fascinated by the singularity people because, you know, they, they're, they kind of hover on the margins there of either being genius revolutionaries that are going to change the world and this is going to be the big thing, or maybe there's a lot of nonsense or pseudoscience going on there. And so, but most scientists don't really deal with that. They're busy doing their own thing. So <clears throat> that's what we do. That's that's fascinating, and we're going to definitely come back to the topic of the technological singularity. But before that, I want to get down, um, or, or at least um, uh, 
put out your idea of, first of all, what does it mean to be a skeptic? Uh, well, skeptic is just, is just being a, a scientist. It's just a scientific way of thinking. Uh, technically, a skeptic is a, a thoughtful inquirer. That's what it means. That, that is, we, we, we come at claims with an open mind, and, and we just want to look at the evidence and see what uh, the basis is of the claim, who's making the claim, the quality of the evidence, how you evaluate the evidence, how the claim fits into the larger worldview of how we know the world works based on previous knowledge and those sorts of things. And <clears throat> there's nothing particularly special about skepticism outside of science because science is by nature skeptical. So if you just think of how science works, you know, we start with the null hypothesis, that is your claim is not true. We just assume it's not true because most claims are not true. And so the burden of proof is on you to provide the evidence to us that in fact your claim is true. And so and you just think of a simple example of how a, a drug produced by a pharmaceutical company gets approval by the FDA to be marketed uh, as a viable uh, drug for whatever it's supposed to do. So the FDA and scientists assume that your drug claims are not true, that your drug doesn't do what it claims it can do. Now you have to actually go out and run the experiments and, and show us that in fact it does do what you claim it can do. And once it meets those criteria, then then it can it, then it can be approved for marketing. Okay, so that's an example that, you know, everybody and their brother claims to have a cure for cancer, or AIDS, or whatever. Um, we know most of these are not true, and uh, and so the burden of proof is not on us scientists to sh to prove that your claim is not true. It's on you to prove to us that it is true. And so that that little principle of the null hypothesis, I think, applies to everything. <clears throat> so take aliens, for example. People claim that extraterrestrial intelligences have come to Earth. Okay, well, that's nice. Uh, but the burden of proof is not on me to prove that they haven't come here. It's on you to prove that they have. Where, where's your evidence? What quali what's the quality of your evidence? And so forth. <clears throat> and... Um, and this is a nice example of, I think, the difference between science and pseudoscience. The SETI people, for example, the scientists that are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, they, they start off saying, we have no proof at all. Uh, now, here's what we're doing to kind of try to test our hypotheses and, and look at this and that claim and so on. Ufologists, by <clears throat> contrast, they say, oh, we know for sure 100% aliens have come here. Uh, and so they start off with the premise that they can't prove and then try to gather evidence to support it. That's not how science works. It's just the opposite of that. So that would be an example of, uh, of what skepticism is and, and how it's like science and, and why a lot of pseudoscientific claims are just that. They're, they're not really doing science. Uh, that, that's fantastic. And, and uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes uh, in support of what you just said is a quote by Carl Sagan who uh, once said that science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. And if we're not able to ask skeptical questions to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, such as ufologists and so on, to be skeptical of those in authority, such as politicians and so on, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious, who comes rambling along. That's my favorite uh, quote to explain my personal skepticism, and I think yeah, it's a I like very that. yeah. But <laughs> Sagan is, you know, one of the great skeptics of all time. So yeah, and, and he's one of my personal heroes. Um, so I, I, I am a great fan. Uh, I grew up uh, behind the Iron Curtain uh, in in communist Bulgaria, and I was very young, probably six or seven years old, when I watched his series on TV in Bulgaria, Cosmos, which wow. was one of the very few Western programs allowed at the time. And it wow. totally fascinated me and it changed my complete world outlook and awareness of, of the place and the universe that we live in. Uh, but let me get back to topic here. And um, th th that kind of a fascinating transition that you made from religion to skepticism how did that happen? That's, that's a very interesting thing, and, and I keep noticing it. For example, just yesterday I interviewed Luke uh, Melhauser uh, of the Singularity Institute, and he grew up in a Christian evangelical family in uh, Minnesota, and his father is a preacher, uh, and, and that's his very strong sort of evangelical background. And then he became, uh, you know, an atheist, 
uh, and went into a completely different direction. So it's always fascinating for me to see how is that process happening, and especially Europe psychologist or psychiatrist. Yeah, psychiatrist. Psychiatrist by education. So how is that happening, and especially in your particular case? Uh, well, there's no formula really. It's it, it it all just depends. I do I did do a a study once on the SETI pioneers, and most of them uh, were deeply religious and then became atheists. And in a way, I I actually speculate that aliens are are deities for atheists, in a way. <laughs> Uh, because if you if you think about how we we portray or think about extraterrestrials, they're always like these super advanced, super intelligent, uh, super moral beings that are like gods that come here. You know, in science fiction, they come here to rescue us, like the day the Earth stood still. The original 1951 film is obviously a Christ allegory. I mean, the the characters, the main character's name is Mr. Carpenter. You know, and he comes to Earth to deliver a message from on high, uh, to warn us about our sinful nature, to tell us to, you know, to get in line with the rest of the galactic, uh, you know, intelligences and so forth, or, or else. And, and then he's killed by the authorities and he's brought back to life out of this, you know, tomb. He's in the jail and, and so on. It's exactly a Christ allegory. And in many ways, I think, uh, uh, what, what we're dealing with there are, is a, a deep human impulse to want to believe in something bigger than us. Uh, I, I do think that's there. So, so, so then that's perhaps a good point to move to the singularity, to the technological singularity as a concept. 